Are you trying to get crazy with this scene? Don't you know I'm loco? loco? <laughs> Today, uh, we are at Hip Hop DX, and it is an absolute honor to be sitting here with uh, three incredibly legendary people. I don't use that term lightly. You know, triple platinum inspired not only generations uh, that have passed, but generations to come. There's still new artists who are talking about your guys' impact on their careers, who are now reaching the peak of their careers. Style, flows, melodies, lyrics. Uh, stage presence, uh, some of the craziest shows we've seen, thought put into everything that you guys have done, but also never uh, straying from from who you are genuinely. So, I, you know, I got to get my flowers whenever I get the chance. So, thank you guys for being here. Thank you very much for that, man. And you know, carrying it back, it, it's it's pretty surreal. And salute to Hip Hop DX for you know, always shouting us out and showing us love and supporting us. You know, that means a lot to us. We've been around 30 years, man, and, you know, a lot of groups get forgotten in, in that mix. But uh, fortunately, we put enough work in to stay recognized by, by um, you know, the folks that still carry on the torch and, and tell the stories and, and highlight a lot of the artists. So, you know, thank you to Hip Hop DX off top. I was watching uh, the documentary, which is amazing. I feel like I learned a lot even from it, but there was a moment uh, at the very beginning where, you know, your photographer, videographer, he was talking about how he didn't realize in the moment that he was living what would be later become legendary. Did you guys recognize what was happening in the moments of those early days? Not really. I mean, not to speak for myself, I was just caught up in the, in the hustle of trying to make the band bigger and better and not really recognizing what was going on around it. I know we were making strains and, you know, we're, we're making gains and, and trying to get bigger, you know, become a bigger, a bigger thing. But, um, for the most part, I think I was kind of like, uh, blind to what was going on and, and, and all the cool things that were happening. I did recognize something, but I didn't think that they would have like the effects, um, that they would have, you know, 30 years later. Yeah. yeah, I think we were just living it, you know, um, the hopes and dreams that we had and, and whatnot, but, you know, the, we didn't have a lot of expectations, you know, so we were just putting in work and seeing, you know, the, the, the movement and the fan base growing gradually and stuff like that. So it, it really didn't hit us till, till much later, at least for me, it didn't hit me till later to see that we were making those gains that Send Dog spoke of and and doing something that, that was connecting and, and that was kind of different. So, um, yeah, seeing it gradually grow was was uh, different because it's not something you expect. But, yeah, I mean, you know, as you're living it, <laughs> breathing it, and, and just continuing on, sometimes you don't, you don't recognize that it is something special like that. You're just trying to keep the momentum going more than anything. It's going on like a blur. You know, so many things were happening at that time and you're getting pulled in so many different directions. You know, it's hard to just sit back and say, wow, you know, what's going on? You know what's going on. You know it's growing, but it's hard to kick back and just like take it in. And, and you don't know how it's affecting like the people that are listening to it. You know how it's affecting their lives, like, you know, at that point in their life that things could be happening and your music is just like uplifting them. We don't see that part, you know, but now we get to hear all the stories of yeah, what it actually did to people. Yeah. Is, is there a moment where you do remember consciously being awe-inspired and looking around you and whether it's on stage or in the studio or just a moment where you're like, what is happening right now? I think there's a lot of those moments where that happened, but I remember one time that it just slapped me in the face was really to do it a New Year's Eve show with Nirvana and Pearl Jam and Ooh. Soundgarden and all those guys. And we're at the sound check when it, and it's an MTV thing. And all of a sudden it was just like, whoa. And I looked at Bo and I said, I think we're here. <laughs> yeah. I, think we, I think we made it, you know? Yeah, for, for me, it, it was uh, a couple of moments. It, it was, uh, you know, before it, anything caught fire for us, I mean, we were private citizens. Nobody knew who the hell we were. We could go anywhere. 
and no one would bat an eye, man. And I, we used to go to this place called the Montebe Montebello Town Center to, you know, go grab the things we had to get. If we didn't go to Compton, we went to Montebello, right? And I remember coming back off of uh, one of our promo tours after Kill a Man starts, you know, having some uh, some success and stuff like that. Um, we go back to that that same mall where nobody recognized us, and it was just thousands of people just, you know, swarmed us. It was crazy. I mean, they kicked us out of the mall because we caused a scene like that. But you know, I, we didn't recognize in the moment what came with the territory. You know, that we would lose our 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 um, privacy as citizens. You know, private uh, our privacy as private citizens, right? You know, like we could walk anywhere and no one knew who we were. Now, we're very, you know, public figures in in the hip hop world, and we got videos on MTV and people are talking about us. And now, you know, this song is this song is uh, making a run for us. So, you know, it was that moment I was like, wow, okay, things changed. And then, you know, we, the the second part to that was we were in Europe with, you know, we were releasing Black Sunday. We hadn't been to Europe on our first album. You know, we just didn't, didn't, uh, didn't have the time to go out there. We we're doing so much promo in the States, trying to build our base there that, you know, we didn't, we didn't have time to go to Europe on the first part of the run. So as we're releasing the Black Sunday album, now we're going out to Europe for the first time and, you know, we're calling home and, our friends are telling us that there's lines around the block for the Black Sunday album, like in, you know, anywhere they go to any music store they went to, whether it was Mama Pop or what was the, the ones that existed back then? Yeah, the plus, music music clubs, plus, and, you know, warehouse, warehouse and all that yeah. stuff that there was lines around the block for our, for our album, Black Sunday, and, you know, it was selling out in different places. And it was unbelievable to me because, I mean, you know, that's not something any of us anticipated, you know what I mean? We, we, we knew we were getting some momentum, but we didn't know what kind of momentum that was. So when our friends are back home saying, we can't get into a record store. I mean, there's lines around the block for your shit. We're like, what? Fuck out of here. And then when we got home, we start hearing all the rumblings and then things really start to shift for us. So that was the second part of it for me, like recognizing that we had something different, really different going on and things had changed for us. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, all those, I agree with definitely. Uh, uh, for me, uh, there was a moment at Woodstock and it's like looking out at the sea of people and everyone just like was there in the moment and to be able to like, not even see the end of, of, of the crowd. It was like, wow, we really, we're here to be on this platform and MTV covering it, the top bands playing this festival, and we were a part of it, you know? Uh, that was real surreal for me. Yeah. I like that, this is major. I was watching that back this morning and I was actually gonna ask, cause it, it's almost unfathomable from the outside, but like I was watching you in, in the crowds, crowd surfing, just look at the biggest smile on your face. Like, do you guys, do anything specific to prepare for a bigger show like that? Or is it just still exactly what you would do normally? It's what we do normally, you know, we get out there, like we're very competitive. We, we want to chop everybody's head off. Like if you're coming on after us, we're, we're trying to give you a problem. <laughs> Friendly competition, yeah, yeah. you know, cause we've toured with a lot of our friends and stuff like that, but we want to be what you talk about when you leave. So we all just go out there with the confidence that we have you know, we do our ritual smoke. We do our ritual p prayer and go to work, you know. Um, and Sen and I had been uh, jumping out in crowds for a while now. You know, Sen Dog actually started two of us. We, we were doing a, um, one of our first shows with the Beastie Boys at the Octagon Room in New York or some, or, or the building, sorry, it was called the building. And, uh, he, you know, it, the, the energy was different for this particular show. We had done many hip hop shows, the jumping up and down and all that shit, hands in the air. But when we did this show, this was the first time we seen people 
you know, moshing and stage diving and crowd surfing to our music, not just the Beastie Boys, and uh, send dog jumps in the crowd for the first time. And I see him do that. I'm like, <laughs> fuck it, I'm going for it too. And I dive in and it, it becomes something different for us because from that show on, we were diving out back and forth, him and I. And sometimes Bobo would throw his ass out there too. So that's but, the first ever crowd surf that you guys that did? first wow. one we ever did. And then we carried it on from there. And then we eventually put that sort of vibe into the Insane in the Brain video. And that sort of sparked more of what you saw in hip hop of now people are moshing and crowd surfing and stage diving and stuff like that. Um, the Beastie Boys had did it, you know, previously, but it was like, with their, you know, because they had a punk rock sort of sensibility because they were punk rock heads first. So the punk rock world was used to that. That's something they they had seen, you know, but in hip hop, we were more traditionally hip hop. We hadn't come from a punk rock scene, although we had a punk rock fucking attitude. And, and uh, the way we got down was, was very much that. Um, we were more hip hop orientated. So when we play when we show this imagery and this energy in the insane in the brain video, you start seeing this now. But so so this is that that was the evolution of that. But like, you know, to, for Woodstock, we just saw it as we're going to do what we do. We're going to go out there, engage. And, you know, if, if, if the vibe is to jump in the crowd, which we both did and got mangled to fuck up, uh, you know, it's what we did, man. I, I can't tell you how many like bags of weed I lost that I forgot to throw out of my pocket, chains that got snatched and shoes, shoes, <laughs> shirts, you know, hair getting pulled when I had it. Um, yeah, man, it was <laughs> crazy. And uh, for that, that particular show, I lost my shoes and socks. Came back on stage. <laughs> not... So you were performing barefoot after that? <laughs> yeah, well, that was the end of the show. Okay. You okay. know, because um, we at that point, we were ending with what uh, you ain't going out, like ain't going out like that. <laughs> so I went out like that. <laughs> I got my shoes and socks. Fortunately, I had an extra pair of ten and a half, so I could barely <laughs> squeeze into. Um, it hurt. <laughs> Trust. Me. But yeah, if it wasn't for his extra pair of shoes, man, I would have been a hippie that day, just barefoot, till we got back to the hotel. That's world. hilarious. Yeah. I, I think it was Woodstock that Alchemist was talking about where he had to yeah. go get Busta Rhymes from the airport, was it? Um, no, I think that, I think that was uh, Smoking, Smoking Grooves. Smoking Grooves, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Alchemist, Alchemist was with us at, uh, at Woodstock. He took a lot of video footage and he yeah. took a lot of photos. Um, some of it, I think some of it was in our documentary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Alchemist had been around us since he was like 13, 14 years ago. And you guys always saw the potential in him? Yeah, I mean, you know, he came to me via Amanda Demi. You know, she was like, hey, you know, there's these two kids. It was Scott Kahn, who is an actor now, and uh, an Alchemist, who was named Mudfoot back then as a rapper. And they were pretty good. They were really good, actually. Alchemist was really dope as a as a... 13 year old yeah. rapper he was badass almost like grand poobah style you know he had a crazy tone in his voice that was kind of high pitched naturally and just his flow was stupid and and he had bars you know and so i decided yeah you know i'll i'll, I'll see what i can do with this and i got them signed to tommy boy but but because they were two white kids um it was kind of taboo still <laughs> yeah and then being from, you know, what what is considered Beverly Hills or West L.A. or whatever, you know, however they were labeled as, you know, Tommy Boyd decided they were only putting out the one single to feel it out. And then they, they squashed it. But what what that did was spark Alchemist to go into like, you know, production and stuff like that and see what the what the creative process is like as a producer, as opposed to just being an MC and. Then he starts, you know, what, going off into his own uh, adventure in this, you know, hip hop, in his hip hop journey. And look, now he's a goddamn legend. Yeah, legend. And salute to the alchemist, man. That's my, my boy right there. Yeah. I, I was, I wanted to go back to even, even further than that. Do you guys remember whether it was on Cypress Avenue or before that, uh, 
when you wrote your first rap that you felt like was good and maybe for you like just musically when you felt like you had something special i think that we always wrote good raps the problem was they were like seven or eight pages long <laughs> and in, in between those seven eight pages there was like a diamond in there you just had to figure out where it was and it was until Muzz came along that he showed us hey you know this part right here is really good get rid of that part get rid of this part I don't particularly remember um, writing an actual song that we used, but I remember, I think B wrote a song, and in the middle of it, he said, here's something you can't understand, and that's when I developed the, the other part, that I came in, I could just kill him, man, and we, again, it was like a five or six song page of yeah, yeah, yeah. rap, and, and we, we, let, we met Muggs here, and then when he heard that part, he was like, hey, hey, hey what was that? You know, that that I remember clearly. I don't remember like actual full, whole song. Just well, being... it was it was two different songs. It was Trigger Happy and another song that yeah. didn't have a name that I had written. And as we're piecing it together, Muggs had remembered something from this song that would really go well with this song. And then it was just a, about how we interchange our voices. And uh, yeah, you know, so he gave us he gave us you know something like that where we could take pieces from other shit that you know and and learn how to structure it that way it doesn't all have to come from this one idea at least that's how killing man was made it was birthed yeah. from two different ideas but after that sen and i sort of got the gist of how you know we put together or we put together these songs and, and structure them properly you know um again we like he said we wrote ages of raps yeah with no to no end you know not having a catchy chorus or a bridge or anything like that and yeah for me i think it was when we put kill a man together i mean i had wrote other things i wrote two songs for his brother on on um on uh his uh album escape right. escape from Vanna. so those were my first two actual songs that i had written that went out professionally through mellow and uh you know because we would trade writing and stuff like that he wrote real estate for for us you know in trade yeah. i wrote two songs for him he wrote the one song for us and uh you know it would go like that because we were all family and yeah he, so things like that would happen but i i think we really caught it like to have something different with real estate kill a man and uh a head on the palm those three were like the first ones where we knew we had something really different and really special. It didn't sound like anything else out there. Yeah, pretty good first few songs. To... <laughs> yeah, I mean, we had been writing a long time, but like songwriting yeah. is different than just writing. Yeah, yeah. You write raps per days, but writing an actual yeah. song and you know having it be like have, having a meaning behind the song and then it structured properly. That was something that that we had to learn, you know, like as we were going. And fortunately, Muggs had been around it through seven, eight, three, and being in the studio with them and and Joe the Butcher and all the people that were creating that album, he sort of soaked up that that knowledge and brought it to us because we were still very raw at that point. Yeah, with with Kilman, I actually I wanted to ask too because obviously with Juice it it blew up, but. Had you guys had any interaction with Pac prior to that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, like Digital Underground were our homies that we met through uh, our, our uh, bro, uh, Jerry Davis, rest in peace. He used to work for ASCAP and he was actually the first guy in the industry who saw the potential in us. So he started introducing us to people. He actually helped us get our first uh, publishing deal with BMG because we were we were assigned to a publishing deal before we got our deal with Rough House and Sony and they actually were the reason we were able to make the demos that got us signed because they gave us the deal and they gave us a little bit of money to go in the studio and make some demos and stuff like that so salute to Nancy Walker and uh, BMG for that solid but you know it was his knowledge that you know, from from those early sessions that, that helped us create this stuff. And, uh, you know, Kill a Man was significant. We, we didn't see that it was going to bang out like that. Yeah. You know, it was a dope song and it was different, but we did not see the the potential in, in, in what was going to happen with it. And it went crazy. And 
even with just the way you guys structure, like with Black Sunday, it's been 30 years, which is crazy. Yeah. But it still holds up musically. Uh, you know, I listened to it yesterday all the way through and the structuring of the songs, like it, it's, it seems so perfectly placed. Like, did you guys go back and forth a lot on where to place those songs? With that one, not really. We were on mushrooms uh, <laughs> when we came up with it. We were up like, I, I remember that we were in New York doing the, the last song, well, at the last song at the time, which was We Ain't Going Out Like That. We had recorded everything previously. Monks and I were in New York for, for about a month or two. And then we brought Sen out the last two weeks to, to fill in the blanks. And as you know, we got caught up with everything, we had one last song, which was We Ain't Going Out. Um, someone gave us some mushrooms and we fucking popped them and that, that was something we were known to do. And we did that whole session mushroomed out like the song We Ain't Going Out like that. Those vocals, him and I are fucking fried in the <laughs> mushrooms. And, you know, after we, you know, after Muggs did the touch-ups the touch on the song, we pretty much turned the lights out in the studio and went through an order of songs. Like, while we were shrooming, we just <laughs> laid back and listened to the album order. And we thought it was dope. We're like, it, in the moment when we were in the world, as we call it, um, yeah. we thought it was dope. And we decided to listen to it, you know, after... And we thought the order was dope as it was. No, we kept that order, but the only thing that changed from from that session to uh, when we put the finish the finished master in Sony's hands was that when we got to Philly, we did one more song, which was "Lick a Shot," and that was implemented somewhere. And I don't know where with where that song is. It's in the middle or something like that. It's in the middle. But mugs mugs placed it properly in there so it didn't it didn't like take away from the vibe that we we had heard the night before with yeah. you know being on shrooms and the order of songs. So what you hear in that order is us shroom the fuck out of our minds, <laughs> like this is the order we like right here. Yeah. And it ended up working for us. It did. So, you know <laughs> the Shout shrooms, out to Mushrooms. Sh shout out to the shrooms. It <laughs> opened our mind up. Do you guys have uh a memorable realization in the world as you said uh while on shrooms or oh yeah anything on, on stage like something that stands up oh yeah, up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah i mean like for for us we would we would do it at, at a lot of shows we would do mushrooms and ass and and, and just go from <laughs> broke you know because that's what some of our some of our musical you know influences they did that so we're trying to live that you know as a squad and and do that so i you know on some of the Lollapalooza shows you know like seeing the crowd like moshing and, and slow down and then seeing everything vividly like front to back you're just that your awareness and visuals are heightened in such a way and then the perception of what's happening while you're doing this i don't know how we kept it together and and, and and finished any songs, but you know, we kept it pro even though we were like totally frying up there. Man. I mean, we finished, I mean, it's crazy that we finished the set. I mean, you know, just go through it and people love it. People, I mean, we were killing it. Yeah. At least in our minds, we were, yeah, you know what I mean? No one, I, I never remember anyone saying, oh my God, they did just were off tonight. Except for our front of house engineer that one time we took shrooms and we didn't tell him. And uh, he started noticing that we was like changing lyrics. All kinds of shroom all references. Kind of, all kinds of really <laughs> shroom references. To like, wrap it up. Well, up to the temple of shrooms, you know. <laughs> so he was the only one that really caught it. But, you know, we were, I guess we were really so focused and knowing that we had to just kill it, that under any circumstances, that's what had to be done. So it's crazy that we did it. Yeah. It was a trip doing that too. Like, you know, because when you have that realization that everybody is watching you in that moment when you are in the melt, boy, it is crazy. Yeah. Yeah, because you, you're you're more tuned in to all of the energy around you. Yes. But but there's a lot of energy at those shows. So. Right. <laughs> it was awesome though. I wouldn't take a bad for anything. I never really 
had a bad trip on stage. It was always just a trip that we were doing it. Yeah, more than anything, like I can't believe we're doing this. I wanted to ask you, speaking of lyrics, I, I was gonna ask you about a particular lyric. Uh, so bring it on when you wanna come fight this outlaw kicking like Billy Ray Cypress Hill. When was the first time you got a real reaction from Billy Ray Cyrus? He never reacted to us. <laughs> never. Um, I, you know, maybe he never heard it. There's um, no way. It could be. I mean, you know, it's it's possible. Um, but he was what was popping at the time, and the line just simply worked. You know, we'll change his name to Cyprus. He probably smokes weed, right? <laughs> yeah. We know daughter does, you know. <laughs> That's Miley Cypress right there. Did, have you ever met her or, or Billy in real life? Ne never, we never came across either one, you know. But uh, it was, yeah, it was a shout out to the achy breaky yeah, phenomenon. No, it works. It works. <laughs> <laughs> was there anyone who was a really surprising fan of yours at the time when you were coming up and you were like, wait, you? you, you. Yeah, um, Daryl Hannah. You know, like we, she came to one of our shows and we're like, really? You know, because our music is kind of aggressive and we, we, we know to her, we know her to be like more of the, from the hippie culture, love and all that stuff. And so, you know, sometimes you don't think that your music is going to impact heads like that because it's so aggressive. Uh, but yeah, turned out she was a huge stoner, <laughs> loved some Cypress Hill, Tom Sizemore too, rest in peace. Yeah. Uh, we ran it to him several times and, you know, he'd repeat lyrics back to us like Tom Sizemore's a Cypress Hill fan. Get the fuck out of here. Um, yeah, you know, like more people than you would imagine, you know. Um, and you don't really take that into um, account as an artist on other artists or other celebrities that might feel your music. You just think music fans, but like when you go to some events and you might see an actress, um, actor, athlete, whatever, and they're like, yo, I love that shit. I grew up to your shit. It's, it's, it's pretty crazy because, you know, you're as much of a fan of theirs as they are you, and it's, it's kind of crazy. So, yeah, you know, those were the two people that surprised me. I'm sure if I, if I thought back, I'd, there'd be an, a, a list of people that surprised me, but, yeah, definitely them too. It's crazy to, to see the influence grow in so many different ways, even like with reggaeton and, and Spanish rap being at the forefront right now. And, you know, I was watching, shout out to uh, my boy Nick, who did a documentary um, about just, it was like Mexican influence um, in hip hop. And a lot of people referenced you guys as like your Spanish album is such a big reason why they wanted to start rapping in the first place. Like, did, is it cool to see and did you realize what that was going to become when when you did that i think like uh, sorry go ahead I, I think like any time that you you could influence people to to become something that they didn't think they could become and then they say well because of these guys here that i started thinking about doing this i think that's the greatest uh, uh amount of respect that someone could say about your gift you ever you know what i mean besides anything else that you want to say like they, they say, you know, I started live, I started rapping because of Be Real, or I made my first group because of Cypress Hill, or something like that. Yeah, that's just that's goes beyond any kind of you know compliment or anything. You know, it's the ultimate. Yeah, I mean, we opened it up, but we didn't know that we were opening it. You know, that door for for others like that, because as as we were saying earlier, we were just living in the moment and carrying momentum, and we knew that we had something different in the sense of that we could rap in two languages. You know, we got our record deal based upon that, you know, that Send Dog could rap fully in Spanish. So oddly enough, we only did one song <laughs> in Spanish per, you know, per album because we didn't want to over, overdo something for a market that wasn't created yet. You know what I mean? We wanted to be considered a hip hop group more than anything, but we knew that we had um, a lot of Latinos out there that got down with us and they reacted to the the sprinkling of, of the Latino vibe that we would put towards each album or the, the, the two albums before that, two or three albums before it. So, you know, we knew that we had a, a fan base of that. We, 
it's part of who we are. So we thought we're going to feed our fan base. So we're going to take some of these songs, translate them, and then make one or two new ones. And boom, there we go. And we didn't really realize that we were going to, you know, spark a culture of, of Latino rappers coming in behind it and saying, you know what? They did it. We could do it. I mean, if we had thought about it at the moment, yeah, okay, yeah, we're going to bring in all these motherfuckers with us. But <laughs> we didn't really think about it. We were just like doing what we knew we were capable of. And that influenced others to say, hey, we're capable of that shit too. And, you know, from that, it sparked off, you know, a lot of Latino rap, reggaeton to a degree, because, you know, a lot of guys were rapping over the reggaeton beats in yeah. Spanish and, you know, killing it. And so, you know, when they give us those accolades and those props, man, it means everything because, you know, <laughs> I'll consider the pocho from, you know, yeah. like from my Mexican half of, of what I am. And in Cuba, I'm a fucking Yankee <laughs> in, in spite of being, you know, my my roots from my mother's side being in Cuba, you know what I mean? So. For for me to be a part of opening this door, it's it's an honor and and quite ironic, if you think yeah. about it. But uh, you know, I, I'm just proud, man, to see all the majorly talented Latinos that came in after us and just made it even bigger. You know what I mean? And in retrospect, we should have did more of it. And we've done features and and, and things like that and verses on others. But, uh, you know, it's never too late. We could still yeah. splash out another one because we were very capable of it. And, uh, yeah, so salute to everybody that get, gives us the props for that, though. You know, it should it should be said that it's us and El, Gen El General who sparked, who sparked the Latin rap shit off. Because, I mean, even though El General was doing more like dance hall, reggae type lip, it was like, a part of the precursor. Yeah. Mellow Man Ace, the Kid Frost, Cypress, El Enera. Yeah. And it, the combination of everything just kind of like... Bust open the door. Yeah. And and going back to, I guess, Henry, do you know what you're, you're, you know, that you're creating this huge movement? And, lo and let me yeah. not forget Lighter Shade of Brown, too, because they were very much a part of the Latino culture in hip they were a hip hop group but they were of Latin descent and they did bust out, you know, little yeah Spanish things here and there, you know what I mean? But yeah, really we we showed something different in that in that Spanish album because I don't think no one thought we were gonna do that. Like, oh here these guys go again. <laughs> yeah. That's just what we do, man. We we try to do shit that that no one is gonna expect, and we try to be out of the box. And that was another thing, you know. So, um, got to be out of the box as an artist sometimes, and out of your comfort zone, because it was definitely not comfortable for me. I I was still new to writing Spanish, where Send Dog was a little bit more familiar. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Was it harder to like get your ideas out? in terms of bars and punchlines and like that. Yeah, my Spanish was always rough. I understood it and spoke it a little bit. I didn't read it normally as, as a kid, but I grew up with it because, you know, my, my parents were Latinos and they a lot of the time spoke in Spanish, my mother more than anything. So I understood a lot more than I could speak. And I learned to write it and I learned to speak it as I went along. But yeah, it was it was tougher for me. Now now it's easier, but back then, man, that shit was. <laughs> <laughs> now Bad Bunny is the biggest artist in the world. Salute to Bad Bunny, man. <laughs> I mean the the movement, the Latin movement, is just like really exploded. Yeah. It's not just like one artist. There's a bunch of them now that's really bad motherfuckers yeah. that are doing it. You know, from all over you know the world. So yeah, there's guys like Trueno. There's guys like. Um, um, man, I just the Santa Fe clan. Um, what's the other? I think that is a Paso Pluma that's blowing up. Uh, well, we're talking people. rappers still. Oh, that's how he's singing. Uh, but you know, there's different, different, you know, people that are really annual. An, yeah. an, an Aleman, yeah, yeah. yeah. An Aleman, is... Aleman is a bad motherfucker from Mexico, bro. And there's like some Colombian rappers out there. There. Killing game, man. And salute to the beat nuts because they were also 
representatives of that, like they're hip hop, but also yeah. like very Latino too. So, yeah, no, it's 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 really amazing to see, and I think it's only gonna spread wider and get bigger too. Absolutely. And speaking of, you know, busting doors open that you didn't realize you were doing at the time with with, with the weed, I think it, it's always so interesting to see looking back because you guys seem to just be living authentically what you were doing, but. Yeah. I was wondering with the so the SNL thing everybody knows about, but you guys were going around places that it wasn't legal to smoke, and you were smoking on stage openly. Were there ever any issues that you guys had, or ever, ever any incidents? Like, I mean, the only for, the only time I ever encountered anything, it was one time in Denver of all places. Um, I can't remember which tour if it was the one we did with Rage Against the Machine, um, or the one after it, but. We we're doing a lot of runs at that point and we get to Denver and the cop comes up to me and goes, I know you smoke on stage, better not tonight. And I was like, what? Okay. I smoked anyway. I said, fuck <laughs> it. Cause we're those guys. If you tell us not to, we're going to. <laughs> and so, you know, I smoked and he gave, came and gave me a ticket for it. And How much was the ticket worth? I don't even know. It was probably like $150 or some shit like this. And we threw that fucking ticket right at <laughs> And it got dismissed. You know what I mean? Fortunately, like, like we got some sort of notification that it got dismissed because the fucking cop was being ridiculous. One, he couldn't prove it was really weed, which it was. <laughs> but he couldn't prove that. It could have just been a prop. And they, you know, just even at the station, they I think they thought it was ridiculous that he would you know, approach us at a show like that. The, the, we thought we would encounter more of that type of shit in Texas. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, hey, you guys smoke up here. We are going to take your asses to jail. And they've warned us a couple of times. And in those places like Texas, you, you can't pop your chest too hard. Yeah. You got to know. Yeah. You got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them, man. And you got to fold it up right there in Texas. So when they warned us, we definitely heeded the warning in Texas. But for a lot of the time, I'll tell you what, we did blaze up. A lot of times they didn't give us no warning and they were just like, let these guys do what they do. And, and <laughs> some of them were entertained by it because they thought these guys don't have the audacity to be smoking weed in front of us. It's got to be prop. Yeah, they don't. And it wasn't. We did have the audacity. We absolutely had it. <laughs> and fortunately, we got away with it, man. You know, um, but salute to all them that let us do what what we do and, and didn't make a big fucking deal out of it because really it's no big deal. A hundred percent. But back then it was. It was, it was at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever use the term Dr. Green Thumb before the song? Hello, my name is Dr. Green Thumb. Hello, my name is No, not necessarily. I mean, it was a, a, a term you use, you know, that you hear when people are good at farming or, or you know, growing shit, you know what I'm saying? And, and you know, my, my partner that is, you know, still one of my partners to this day in the, in the cultivation and, and our cannabis game, you know, when we were growing in the early days, that's where it came from. You know, he was actually really good at it. So, you know, Hence, you know, Dr. Green Thumb, him and I and, and one, of, one of my other partners, we were blowing it up in my garage. And we went for what we had, it was actually really good. So hence the Dr. Green Thumb song. But actually, it, it didn't really spark out of that. It was sparked out of a, a sketch we did for a radio um, show that, that Bobo and I used to do. We used to do a, a show called the Soul Assassin Radio Show. Not the one you hear on uh, Shade 45 with, with Urn and Muggs, but the, the precursor to that, which is what we were doing on terrestrial radio on 92.3 The Beat. Um, we, would, we would write a number of sketches because we wanted it to be more like a, a morning show as opposed to a, a standard mix show. So we'd, we'd write sketches and stuff like that to go in between mixes and stuff like that. And one of the sketches was Dr. Green Thumb, you know, and uh, we wrote it to be like an infomercial. And uh, we ran it 
And then one one morning when we were working on that particular album that that song's on, which album is it? Is the four four? Um, I show up to the studio and this beat Muggs has just yelled Dr. Green Thumb at me. And then we attached that sketch to the song. So the sketch was written before the song. And the, the, the song, the sketch inspired, well, it just sort of bridged, didn't necessarily inspire the song. Because when I heard the beat, it just jumped at me. Hello, my name is Dr. Green Thumb. And, yeah. you know, it just sort of made sense to bridge that that uh, that sketch we had written to the song. And that's how it was all birthed. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of what you guys were talking about with piecing together the songs early on with Kill the Man. Like, Very much comes from that, you know, uh, you, being open enough to see it as opposed to, this is the idea and I'm just sticking to this as opposed to being open to other things taken out and rearranging us and, and things like that. You know, we've always been open like that so you know fortunately that works for us and uh, who knew it would be my cannabis brand yeah <laughs> years later yeah i mean you really took it like they were green thumb dr green thumb parties oh yeah you know and used to do like that almost every month for at, a minute at the house of blues we could have yeah. yeah so like we was building up the name and then we really built it up like here on stage like doing the song and the video the whole thing so and doing like what digital underground did in yeah. in regards to making it a character you know the way um shock rest of peace did humpty hump although i do not have a twin like he did that he could out shock g out while he's doing humpty you know i could not do that i didn't have a twin so you know i would have to go and flip into the dr green thumb you know garb and come out do the song and then flip back out or stay with the garb and do the rest of the show but yeah, it was it bringing to, to life the idea of this character. So yeah, it was, it was <laughs> birthed off a sketch. That's good. When, when was the first time you officially played a show with them? Uh, it was in 92, actually, because uh, I had met uh, them on the road, um, BC Boys. Yeah. And you know, check your head. So I was hanging out a lot with them during the tour on their bus and everything. And uh, after that tour, you know, we kept in touch. Me and Sin were uh, talking a lot. I would call a B when, you know, just check in. And uh, Sin had said, yo, man, would you come down and do this show with us, uh, El Camino uh, College? But they were doing some uh, kind of event, scholarship thing. And uh, I played I played one song. I played Latin Lingo. But that was the first time I actually doing anything on stage with them. Then the second one was at the China Club uh, in Chicago. And that was before the Soul Assassin tour. That was like fish like you coming, you coming with us. So uh, yeah, it, it was like that. But we really started to, you know, get, get tight during the BC board, check your head tour. Cause I was always hanging out with them and smoking with them. What was the biggest difference between playing between the two groups at the time? Um, you know, I I, uh, I say it now that, you know, there's a difference between like, you know, brothers and cousins, you know, I mean, uh, with BC's, you know, it was a great, you know, band vibe, everything was cool, you know, but it was like the BC boys, it was, it was them. With Cypress, it was almost like a, a community, a family thing for everybody that was involved. So it was kind of like, welcoming in a way that you know they didn't need to have me but they welcomed me into what i can possibly do you know musically with them so it was a different vibe a different feeling and plus they had really good weed, really good weed. <laughs> that's shocking to hear I <laughs> you know, i'll say you know when send dog hit me up about that i was totally open because i knew what he was capable of you know, I didn't know it would turn into that he would become one of our brothers, you know, not just a hired, you know, gun, but like one of us, you know, and uh, Sen made that call. Um, and that was an important call because it, 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 he adds something to our show that no one else does. And it's, it's something different than what you hear on the record. It adds to it. It doesn't like, 
like we never thought like what he's doing is fucking up the groove of this it actually adds to it people fucking ate it up so that was a, a call by the coach over here who you know knocked that one down he he had a couple great calls i gotta say <laughs> the funny guy right here well with bobo i always thought when i saw him play with the beastie boys i was just like oh shit i didn't i didn't i didn't think you could put a conga player with a hip-hop band i don't know why it never dawned on me but when I saw him, I was like, oh man, that, that would sound really cool with us. So we could, you know, play him on some of our, you know, Latino sounding stuff. And uh, and when he came and did it, I, I was like, okay, you know, let's do it again. You it know, I, I, right what, away. yeah, and I think what it is too is that, you know, when you get musicians, sometimes they overplay on hip hop because they're used to the way you play with a band and you can't necessarily, necessarily play that same way with the fills and the extra shit, you know, it just sometimes clashes and it doesn't make sense because hip hop doesn't have a lot, well, at that point, it didn't have a lot of fills or anything like it was straight yeah. forward, right? Even in the arrangements. And Bobo had an understanding of this where he wasn't trying to overplay and do shit that was not gonna fit in the context of the song. Um, he was very much a student of, of the game in hip hop, you know, he came from jazz and Latin jazz and, and the Latin roots and all that stuff where you tend to do those fills and all those extra fucking things. So when you get somebody used to that and they don't understand this, it, it's a clash. But when Bobo came in, he showed us exactly how you do it. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it impressed the fuck out of us, you know, so when he when he actually played the El Camino gigs where Sen and I were like, why don't we just get him to play with us when he's off? You know, yeah. and fortunately that worked that worked out. And you know, as as we were doing that, we realized that this dude was like not just a player, he's one of us. He liked all our good weed too. <laughs> you know, it was crazy with the Black Sunday, uh my con contribution to Black Sunday. One time Bebo calls me up and he says, hey, uh, you know, let me ask you something. Uh, you know, I play keyboards. So, yeah, yeah sure. I can dabble a little bit. All right, well, come on over to uh, our engineer's studio over at Jason Roberts. Uh, and I, I want you to play on something. And it happened to be for the video when the shit goes out. And you know, there's a storyline on, on that video and it's like kind of Scarface thing. So... He had me play all this little keyboard Scarface, like, you know, orchestra kind of thing. And that wound up being in the video. And this is before I even actually went on tour or do anything. So it was like, I was already kind of getting in a little bit with the whole get down. Yeah. So uh, here it is. It worked out. And I was, I was going to ask you too, was there an, another one of those calls that you mentioned where you're you know, maybe there was some disagreement, but you stuck with your gut and it ended up turning out. Yeah, um, early on, um, we were, we weren't even signed yet. And we had an offer from a label. Hollywood basic. Yeah, but they wanted to strip us down and like, with no curse words, no marijuana, you know, talking about that. There's no violence, no nothing. And then we had this little label out of Philly that was probably offering like a third of the money that this other label was. 250 in comparison to 75. Yeah. So I was like, well, these guys here said we could say whatever we want. And I knew him. I knew B had a lot that he was conjuring up in his mind all the time. So I was like, we need to have that freedom of being able to say whatever the hell we want. And this label here in Rough House, they guaranteed us that to where this label here was trying to make us Disney, you know, pop, you know, whatever. Not only, I never understood like how they could listen to our music and think and try to strip it down and be like, we like you guys, but you yeah. know, in rock and roll and you know, in, in real music that comes from in it within, you can't put limits on on what you could say lyrically or how you can express yourself because I feel that what what you're going through, someone else in the world or maybe millions of people else in the world are also going through it, and you have to be able to touch that by what you say and the things that you do. And when you start trying to strip people and artists down and make them something that they're not, that's when it could go wrong. So for that reason, <clears throat> I was like, no, 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 let's go with these guys better because they offered us that that freedom to just do whatever we want and be whatever we want. Yeah, for extra context, you know, um, 
Hollywood Basic was owned by Disney. So literally, it would have been. <laughs> yeah, so they, they, they liked the fact that we could do Spanish stuff, or at least at that point, he could do Spanish stuff. But they didn't like any of the other stuff, like the, the aggressive songs, like how I could just kill a man, hand on the pump, and and all that stuff. And then, you know, coupled with the cannabis, you know, they, they were unsure. They kept wanting demo after demo after demo. Pretty soon they had half the, half of what would have been the album at that point, whereas how Sendog stated that Rough House was like totally inspired by what we had already had and they didn't need to hear it anymore and they were ready to go. And I remember Sendog saying, hey man, we're gonna sign the fucking Rough House or I'm going back to work because I'm not signing the Hollywood Basic. We got to sign here or I'm going back to fucking work and send it in mugs and I were like, I guess we're going to Rough House. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, it was a better, it was a better play because Joe the Butcher, who had worked with Muggs with VS783, believed in what Muggs was doing. He, he seen Muggs as a visionary and a very talented producer, you know, who, who, knew what he wanted to do and had a sound as opposed to oh i gotta take this guy i gotta show him how how you navigate this now nah. he was like this guy knows i'm betting on him and then you know when he's hearing what sen and i are doing on top of what mugs is putting together you know he saw the whole picture him and chris saw the whole picture um and then the adventure started from there but it wasn't until he put the stop on it because we would have just kept giving them fucking demos forever and maybe Rough House moves on while wow, these guys were taking too long we're gonna go sign Criss Cross or whoever the hell they yeah. was was next in the chamber for them but it was uh that decisive foot stall by the coach here uh that, <laughs> that, that made that happen man you know and uh God works wonders through people man and he did that through Sendar you know I've always been into rappers that are outspoken and say the things that people aren't expecting to hear you know what i mean like yeah. chuck d and ice q yeah. and krs and all those guys and i i kind of felt like we had that in b also you know what i mean and how could you i could use like a sense for that tone it down yeah, yeah you, you just it didn't make any sense to me so I don't think I was seriously gonna go back to work. Yeah. I just <laughs> I what was work at the time. Was was, uh, I was a warehouse guy, shipping okay. and receiving, throwing boxes around and stuff like that. So <laughs> that was a good threat. Yeah. yeah, but you know, I, I, all my friends were making the move from whatever they were doing into being artists, and I wanted to do the same thing. You know, working was good and it was great, and I probably could have done that for thirty years too. But um, this has been way more fun. Yeah. Well, you mentioned Cube, I know, and that tour was announced overseas tour a couple of days ago actually but so I, I went on the rabbit hole and went all the way back down to the history you guys but uh, I was watching the TV interview you guys did where you were talking about wanting to kind of make peace in the city a little bit more and, and have an example you know, I, had, I mean we don't had our, our share of problems you know but you know we working together to work that out you right. know and uh you know, maybe if the public see us work out our problems, they'll work out their problems, you know? What, what were the conversations like that led up to that moment where publicly you guys were like, all right, let's squash this? Oh, you know, to to, to go all the way back, we started as, as really good friends. I mean, he came to our How I Could Just Kill a Man video in New York. He was out there for promo for something he was doing, found out we were there, and he came down there and then embraced us from there. Started wearing our stuff, called mugs to produce beats. We did the show uh, tour with him in Australia and a few other things in the stateside. We were friends, you know, like really good friends. And, you know, with the, <laughs> over over some music, it flipped, you know, we start beefing. So all up to that, from that point on, we were like going at each other, at each other's shows and, you know, just talking, talking shit wherever we could about each other. And, it came to a head, I think, in 96. And uh, some things and conversations happened between people in the middle of us that um, sparked a conversation between me and Mac-10 first. And, you know, Mac-10 called me and, you know, we decided, hey, listen, this before anybody gets, you know, gets really hurt because we got the type of people that this will happen. Um, 
we decided, hey, let's squash it. You know, let's just be cool and let's, you know, I understand that you were backing him up and, you know, my reaction to you was for what you said. I got nothing against you. So let's, you know, stop it right here. We'll never say a negative thing about each other again. And, you know, we'll, we'll perhaps work together because, you know, I'm a fan of you and it's mutual and things like this, right? This is the type of conversation him and I have. And then, you know, he says to me, what about with Q? Would you talk to him? I said, yeah, he's just got to call me like, like you called me and, you know, we'll, 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 we'll strike all this shit down because realistically I have a lot of respect for Q, you know, I, I, I looked up to him to be honest with you. So it was kind of tough beefing with them, but we're like, not the guys that who will be, you know, pushed around or pushed aside or stepped on or any of it, you know what I mean? So we had to stand our ground for what, what we felt the whole starting of it was. But like in the end, when Mac 10 called me, I was like, yeah, let's just tell him to call me and we'll have a conversation. Him and I had an honest conversation and we put to put our, you know, all our grievances to rest right there and said, hey man, you know, we need to be cool with each other as opposed to this. Cause this doesn't look cool. Our people might get hurt behind it because you know how it is, you know, me and you may never see each other, but some of our people might, and in our names, they might get into some shit and it turn into something different. So, you know, we, we decided right then and there that we would not say another negative word about each other. We would squash it right then and there and make it known. And, uh, there was a show he had at, um, uh, it's called One Oak now, but it was all uh, maybe Billboard Live or the Key Club then. He told me to come down to that show. <laughs> and I showed up. I didn't come with anybody. I didn't have any security. I didn't even take any of the homies. I'd like totally walked in the building myself. And everybody that didn't know the beef was over. Were you nervous a little? No, hell. <laughs> nah. I grew up, born and raised in LA, man, just as much as any, you know. So, like, I felt safe. And so I went into the building and everybody was like, whoa, you're here. I'm like, what? Oh, man. You know, so they think something's about to tear <laughs> down, right? And they don't know you called me, and, you know. So when I show up on stage, the whole crowd gets lit up and boom, everybody, at least at this show, knows beef's over. We're cool. Done deal. And then we eventually do a song with Shaq to let people know, like he was the one first one that put us together on a song called Super Friends to let people know, cause he was a fan of both of us and yeah. he wanted to be a, be the bridge. So, you know, Shaq was the bridge, salute to Shaq. Yeah, that's great, Shaq, Shaq yeah. helps. Yeah, awesome. yeah, yeah. He, helped, he helped like, men did even yeah. more by putting us on a song. And then eventually Warren G puts us on a, a song together and war and i did it in the beginning and then there was a remix so slowly but surely letting people know hey we're cool again then it eventually you know came to us doing shows uh, together again and people were mind blown that maybe had no one they were like oh shit, they're yeah cool. they're in the same building because social media wasn't a thing too so like every time they got to see you on stage they might have not have been in the same like yeah, aware yeah, yeah. and yeah. you know so Fast forward to all these years, we've been doing shows with him a lot in the yeah. last couple of years, like a package with us, well, him, us, and Bone Thugs and Harmony and a few others. And uh, we just did Australia again with them, which was phenomenal. Him and Doug C. ripped it when did our thing, and we're about to go back and do some more stuff with Tim and, and knock Europe down. So it, it's crazy coming full circle yeah. like that, because where we were at when we were beefing, it was pretty ugly. Um, but you know, peace is better. Yeah. You know, we, 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 we have, uh, positions in, in hip hop and, and just, you know, in our community and for us to be beefing, it just, you know, that, that it could only last so long before something really horrible happens. So, um, it was better that, uh, we both took that route to have a conversation, put the beef to bed and, and showed unity. Yeah, you know, and still showing it. We we got some some things coming up in the future that are you know, people gonna be surprised by and they're gonna love the shit. So you know, we're excited about that. I had love for him, okay. so 
Okay. I, I wanted to squash it, and I know right. you wanted to squash it, so the best thing we could do for us, right. for ourselves first, and for, you know, everybody who... Oops. Rabbit <laughs> door. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. <Rabbit> door. <laughs> I guess to close off, um, you know, we could obviously talk for hours, but I appreciate your guys' time. Is there something you guys are most looking forward to right now in terms of the music, endeavors, things that people should look out for? And for me, it's it's um, the celebration of this Black Sunday album, playing with the orchestra that was birthed by the idea of the Sim Simpsons, you know what I mean? Which is crazy, I was gonna ask yeah. about that too, yeah. You know, they, they, uh, they put in an episode of Homer Palooza you know, a play on Lollapalooza. And we were a part of the that particular episode with Smashing Pumpkins and Peter Frampton, and we steal Peter Frampton's orchestra unknowingly because we're stoned. And uh, I think what happened was uh, we, we tweeted that out and tagged the London uh, Symphony, um, and then they retweeted it. And so the idea was like, we should actually make this happen. So um, the first one we're going to do is in Denver. And so we're looking forward to doing that. And we're going to work our way up to London and try to actually fulfill the dream and do the London fill. Listen, the Simpsons do predict everything ahead of time. So, yeah. <laughs> or, and they predict and inspire. Mm. You know what I mean? So like, you know, so the thing you might have saw at the Simpsons, at the Simps on the Simpsons that you never thought of like because that's something we hadn't thought of you know rocking with the symphony or an orchestra or whatever and then you know it became a theme so we're like you know what let's play to that theme as much like us speaking spanish and, and being able to rap in spanish people were like why don't you do a spanish album hence espanol exitos en espanol whatever grandes exitos en espanol it's it's those things you know like why don't we you know, and being out of the box and getting out of the comfort zone, just like we said earlier, man. So salute to the Simpsons for giving us that idea. That was everything. Did they, what was the call like? Was it like, do you remember what they said? They just, you know, they wanted us on an episode and we went in there and we did the voiceovers. No, none of the other um, artists were there. None of the, the other characters were, they just needed our dialogue. But it was surreal to walk in their studio and be like, oh, this is where it all happens, you know, and uh, I'll never forget it, man, because, you know, we're, we're a part of the Simpsons culture forever. Did you guys light up? We lit up before and after. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to blow their studio up. We know how that goes. We'll never get invited back. It's, it's like I said, yeah. yeah. <laughs> how about you guys? Anything particular you're looking forward to? Um, these days, just being in, in the band is pretty interesting. You know, a lot of... Uh, anniversaries and special dates that are coming up and whatnot and you get a chance to reflect on you know what the things that we did you know years ago that actually you know means still mean something today and i i'm very proud of you know the band and my bandmates and the things that we've been able to do the ups and the downs and the good times and bad times and everything because it's not all good times you know and um and now we're here and we're celebrating you know black sunday you know 30 years of that and our, our first album is even older than that. So, you know, now's the, you know, the time to, the, these are the years to celebrate our, our, our history. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's pretty fun and it's interesting. And we're getting to do a lot of cool things like, um, getting a star on the walk of fame. Yeah. And, you know, and all the people that turned out for that and, and where they put us at in the city, Cruz square, you know, it was also, a, you know, a fitting thing. So it's a lot of interesting things happening. And I, I, I couldn't have seen any of that 30 years ago. But I'm glad that I'm seeing it now and, and, you know, getting a chance. My kids could, you know, live it with me type of thing. So, yeah, very, very interesting time in our in our careers. Yeah. It's crazy to still be on stage and sharing all this stuff with these guys. You know, what I mean, it's like half of our lives we've been doing this together. And it's like it's a real family and brotherhood and I'm I'm enjoying like looking back at all of that because you know like done a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff was a blur, but there's things that come back. Like you remember this, you remember this, and like we're able to share those 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 times because on the road it's only us. You know we're 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 family. We're away from our immediate family. You know it's like 
it's us. So we have experiences that, you know, are just lifetime things and just being able to celebrate that and yeah. hear all the stories from the people say, yo, how we've influenced them or inspired them is great. I'm enjoying all of that. So I look forward to more of that. Well, last question, who is Cypress Hill to you guys? That, that, no, no. We're still trying to figure that out. <laughs> uh, I don't know, man. Um, we're 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 some guys who believed in ourselves, if nobody else did, and we weren't afraid to keep pushing and pushing. We had the faith and belief, and you know, we're still those same guys today. And I think that's why we still do it on the same level that we do it we got the same love for each other we got the same love for what it is we do and uh yeah well appreciate it thank you so much again flowers uh go out to all you guys and thank you for the time thank you. thanks for having you with us sir what's up i'm b real aka dr green though i'm sending dog i'm eric bobo and we are cypress hill you're watching hip-hop dx